Okay, I'll get started. So hello and welcome to our 42nd seminar of the Centre for Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Dr. Sonia Browser, a research fellow here at the CRE and co-facilitator of the seminar series. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and many of our participants joining us today are located on the lands of the tradi traditional custodians in Australia. Today, I'm speaking to you from the land of the Turrbal people. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend this respect to any First Nations people joining us online today. Today, we're delighted to have Associate Professor Dana Wong joining us from La Trobe University, Melbourne. Before I formally introduce Dana, I'm going to just briefly cover some housekeeping. If you haven't already done so, please do join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE Community of Practice. We welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, sorry, health professionals, researchers and organisations. The CRE is always looking for financial support, so if you do wish to donate, please see our website for details. You can connect with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook, and we now have a blog where you can read all the latest findings and calls from participants. You can subscribe to research blog updates through email, and as always, please feel free to tweet along with today's seminar using the hashtag AphasiaCRE. Please note that this seminar is being recorded for future viewing. The Aphasia CRE's YouTube channel contains past seminar recordings, and today's seminar will be uploaded within a few days. Now, during this presentation, you may have questions for Dana. Dana, sorry. <laughs> Please ask these questions by writing them in the question and answer function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, rather than the chat box. Enter your question for Dana at any time throughout the presentation. You'll also be able to see questions asked by other audience members. You can then like or upvote a question to show those of most interest to the wider group. And at the end of the presentation, Dana will answer as many questions as time will allow. Please reserve this Q&A space for questions only. Keep your brief questions as brief as possible and no comments, please. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dana Wong. Dana is an Associate Professor and Clinical Neuropsychologist in the School of Psychology and Public Health at La Trobe University, and has active research role, roles in research, teaching and clinical practice. She leads the ENACT research group, which focuses on developing, evaluating, and implementing cognitive and psychological interventions for people living with stroke and brain injury. She's an affiliate of the Aphasia CRE's Optimizing Mental Health and Wellbeing stream, and enjoys working with multidisciplinary colleagues to improve accessibility of research and clinical services for people with cognitive and communication difficulties. Diana is president of the Australasian Society for the Study of Brain Impairment. She's co-chair of the Neuropsychological Intervention Special Interest Group of the International Neuropsychological Society and a committee member for the Organization for Psychological Research into Stroke. Now, with that very impressive bio, I'd like to welcome Dana and thank her for joining us today. And I'll now hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia, for that kind introduction. Um, I would also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which um, I am today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Okay, hopefully you can see my slide okay now. Um, I want to say uh, a big thank you to Sonia and John and the Aphasia CRE for inviting me to talk to you today about um, how we can adapt our measures and processes and interventions for people with cognitive and communication difficulties. And I'll talk specifically about how we might have done that in, um, in some work that I've been doing over the past few years on valued living. So I'll talk more about what valued living is all about in a moment. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say that um, I don't consider myself an aphasia expert. Um, most of my clinical work and research has been um, more in the area of cognitive impairment and psychological difficulties after stroke and brain injury. Um, but I've been very lucky to work with lots of the aphasia CRE researchers over the last few years. 
And in those projects and collaborations, um, I've really noticed that there's uh, a lot of overlap um, in terms of the barriers that people with aphasia face and the people that um, cognitive impairment face in terms of how they connect with other people and, and the world and how they manage the demands that the world, they face in the world. So um, I hope that some of those synergies um, uh, I'm able to illustrate over the course of the presentation. Okay, so valued living um, is also called value consistent action. This is the extent to which an individual engages in actions um, consistent with their personal values. So um, for example, uh, one of my values is um, for the work that I do to have an impact that helps others. So um, by giving this presentation today, that's a, an action that's consistent with that value. Um, we know that higher valued living is associated with better well-being um, and that lower valued living is associated with uh, higher psychological distress and depressed mood. Um, and those associations are observed across both neurotypical and clinical cohorts. So this, this idea of doing what matters to us, doing what's important, is a really fundamental construct for how we go about life. Uh, so we looked at the relationship of valued living with outcomes after traumatic brain injury um, in this study that was um, done as part of Celia Pace's uh, doctoral research uh, a few years ago. And what we found in this study was that um, people who uh, had had a traumatic brain injury within the last five years um, showed uh, significantly reduced valued living um, and that, that those reductions were associated with um, uh, functional and psychosocial outcomes. So we saw this pattern over time where, so we asked people to sort of estimate their levels of valued living pre-injury. And you can see that um, in the first year, this dropped quite significantly. So um, in that first year, people with traumatic brain injury did not feel that they were doing as many things in line with their personal values. That stayed low um, for the next one to three years. And then at three to five years, it increased again. Um, and this was an interesting pattern that didn't seem to be related to the fact that everyone had gone back to work at that stage, but rather seemed to reflect um, an adjustment to their lives post brain injury and the fact that they found new ways of, of um, living in accordance with their personal values at that time. So as, as a sort of related um, study, we also looked at uh, how associated, um, how valued living was associated with post-traumatic growth or positive growth following brain injury. And um, we also looked at, at how, um, how positive growth was manifested in terms of um, behaviors. And you can see on the right here that uh, there were a number of things that reflect uh, values about relationships with family and friends, um, appreciation of small things in life like nature and kindness and simple pleasures pets and dogs, um, acting with consideration and kindness for others, and taking up new interests and activities. And uh, so this kind of reflects some of those um, perhaps new ways of, of um, living in accordance with values um, uh, post brain injury, when things like paid work may be, um, the, the capacity to engage in those may have changed. We also wanted to then look how did these how do these findings apply to a broader acquired brain injury sample um, that includes stroke, for example, as well as traumatic brain injury? And we did a follow-up study um, in partnership with Alfred Health to look at this. Um, what we wanted to do was replicate that past study in traumatic brain injury and investigate whether valued living might differ among different types of acquired brain injury and um, look at, uh, again, how valued living changed over time post-injury, and um, importantly, to explore relationships between valued living and then psychological and occupational outcomes like work and volunteer work and study as well. Um, so in this study, we had um, a mixed ABI sample that um, was mainly comprised of stroke survivors. What we found was that there wasn't really any difference between um, stroke and TBI uh, groups in terms of their valued living scores. And um, as we found in the, in the first study, valued living was indeed associated with better psychological outcomes. Um, and that uh, 
that value living was higher for those who were engaged in at least one type of productive activity. And it didn't seem to matter whether um, that was paid employment or not um, paid employment. So um, the, the benefits of valued living um, were just as strong for um, engagement in things like volunteer work and study. So um, from this study, I guess, highlighted that changes in valued living after injury uh, are unlikely to be diagnosis specific. Um, and that you know many people with ABI would benefit from support to engage in valued living over several years post injury. This seems to be an important um, aspect of um, adjusting to life post injury. Um, and importantly, doesn't that doesn't mean just engaging in paid work. There's other activities um, that are just as important for fostering a sense of value and purpose. Um, and so you know supporting individuals to engage in those activities that are personally meaningful can really foster that sense of living a life of value and, and meaning. So with all that as background to, I guess, highlight the importance of, of valued living as a construct and a target for intervention, um, one of the important issues in this field is how we measure valued living. Um, so um, I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this because it's, it's, um, it is an important aspect of trying to identify who might um, struggle with valued living or value consistent action and who might need support. And then also in terms of measuring the outcomes of our interventions. So uh, the most commonly used measure of valued living and, and probably the first that was developed, it's called the valued living questionnaire. Um, and what you do in this questionnaire, um, it has sort of two parts. In the first part, you rate the personal importance of each of 10 areas of your life. So you can see here there's family relations, marriage or um, intimate relationships, parenting, friendships, employment, education, training, recreation, spirituality, citizenship or community life, and physical well-being. So in this first part, you rate how important each of those life domains are to you on a scale of one to 10. So one being not at all important and 10 being extremely important. Um, and then in the second part, what you do is rate how consistent your actions have been with each of your values in the past week. Okay, so, um, uh, so for example, in terms of family relationships, perhaps you could do this now, have a think about in the last week, have, you, um, have your actions been in line with your values um, about your family, how important that is to you um, in the last week? Okay, so just hold that in your mind and have a think about how you might answer that. Um, now I'm going to step back a bit to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the processes that are involved in answering questions on a questionnaire like that, Valued Living Questionnaire. So you know, what we need to do when we answer questions on a survey or a questionnaire is we need to understand what's being asked. Okay, so that's just comprehension of the question. We then need to retrieve information um, from memory um, that's relevant to answering the question. We then need to make a judgment um, about what answer is appropriate. And then we need to produce or select a response. Okay, so, um, so for example, um, let's say I asked each of you to write down your answer to this question, which I'll invite you to do. So you can just write it down to yourself. You don't need to share your answer to anyone. Um, so on a scale of one, not at all anxious, to 10, extremely anxious, how anxious have you felt about work or study in the past fortnight? Okay, so just have a think about that and write down your answer. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you to have a think about what cognitive processes you were using to answer that question. What were you thinking about? How did you, what were you considering in your answer to that question? Um, what we might find is that all of these aspects or, or cognitive demands of answering that question um, will impact the way you answered. So um, firstly, in terms of question comprehension, the way you interpret the concept of anxious and what you might count as work or study could vary between different people. 
Um, what if you aren't working or studying at the moment? You know, what? How, how do you answer then? So the comprehension of the question may may vary between individuals. Then, you know, you needed to, um, so you were asked about how anxious you felt over the last fortnight. So then um, to, to answer that, you needed to recall how you felt um, and what you were thinking about and perhaps what you were doing over the past fortnight and, and bring that to memory. Um, and, and then you needed to, um, I guess, estimate overall over the course of that fortnight, your kind of average level of anxiety over that time, um, which might be tricky because it might have gone up and down a fair bit and or there might be might have been like a day where you felt particularly anxious but the rest of the time was fine so then how do you answer um, in relation to the, the whole fortnight that that takes judgment and estimation um, and then you know producing or selecting a response so choosing a number that actually reflects that overall estimation of your anxiety in the last fortnight so there's a number of different cognitive processes you can see are at play in answering that question so in terms of the valued living questionnaire um, when we used that questionnaire in some of our initial research, we noticed that people were responding, particularly to the second part where you ask about um, how consistent their actions have been with their values in the last week. Um, many of our participants with acquired brain injury were answering that in a way that didn't seem to reflect what we knew about their lives and, and what they'd been doing in the last week um, and how they felt about that. And so we wondered about how well people were or how accurately people were actually interpreting what they were being asked to answer. So what we did was a, um, a cognitive interviewing study um, which where we were aiming to identify common difficulties or errors associated with the comprehension and completion of the value living questionnaire in people with ABI um, and, and we aimed to do that to because we had already in our mind the idea of potentially adapting the measure to be more appropriate for people with uh, cognitive and communication difficulties. So cognitive interviewing methodology is, is uh, um, a method that you use to probe people's understanding of items on a questionnaire. So what you do is you, you ask them to answer the question and then you ask a follow-up question to say, to ask them, you know, how can you tell me how you decided on that rating? What were you thinking about when you, um, when you gave that answer? And uh, so then we transcribe those interviews and analyze those data by um, aggregating, um, you know, comprehension issues that occurred across interviewed. We had 11 participants. Um, they had a range of different forms of ABI. Um, so there were seven stroke survivors, two with TBI, two with brain tumor. Um, we had the, the participants were impaired on at least one cognitive measure and uh, several of them also had communication difficulties. Um, so we saw that 11 comprehension errors were commonly made by these participants. Um, and so, and these occurred across multiple participants. So um, I'll, I won't go through every single one, but I'll pick out a couple just to illustrate. So, um, you know, in this, in the part two question where it says, how consistent were your actions in the last week with each of your, your values? Um, there was confusion around the term consistency. So um, some people interpret that as meaning how consistently did you act in line with your values over the last week? So did you do that all the time or just some of the time? Um, whereas in fact, it, the consistency concept relates to um, how aligned the, their actions overall were with their values. So the interpretation of that question was um, not in line with its intent. The other thing that was tricky is that, um, you know, for domains that were considered not very important to somebody. So if somebody, um, for example, rated parenting is not, not a priority for them at the moment, um, because they're not parents perhaps. Uh, so if that was rated low in importance and then they hadn't really done much in the last week that was relevant to parenting, then, um, then theoretically you should rate that highly because you have um, acted in line with your values by not doing things that weren't important to you. But that's a bit of a mental juggle, you know, to, to make that um, reversal. So if you haven't really followed what I just said there, it's it's okay. That's um, we're certainly not alone there. Um, and so, yeah, that, that trickiness with rating the value, the consistency of action for values that weren't important um, was a, was a difficult um, thing for, for many people. So, 
yeah, several features of the valued living questionnaire did pose challenges for our participants with cognitive difficulties. And as I said, some of them had communication difficulties also. So this um, highlighted the need for an adapted version of the valued living questionnaire, which is better suited to this cohort. So that um, led on to our, our next study, which has just been submitted um, about how we developed the valued living questionnaire comprehension support version and validate that in, with adults with acquired brain injury. So um, we used a, a range of adaptation methods. Um, so you might've seen um, Emma Power on, on the author team here, um, whose um, speech pathology and aphasia expertise was um, super handy and she contributed a lot to this adaptation. So um, uh, we followed principles of uh, cognitive and communication support in this adaptation by using simple and high frequency words, short sentences, um, uh, large font, um, and using bolding and underlining of key concepts, spacing each question on a separate page so you're not distracted by the other questions, um, increasing the amount of white space between the question and the response set, and using a multimodal presentation of important concepts, um, including pictorial or visual aids, simplifying and um, uh, instructions and then building in repetition and um, and paraphrasing of, of key concepts, using concrete examples, which I sh I'll show you in a moment, and um, adding um, some visual aids to the rating scale as well. Um, in addition to these general principles of communication support, we also um, changed uh, a, a number of things in the content and the structure of the questionnaire to directly address the comprehension errors that we had identified in the cognitive interviewing study. So for example, um, you know, I talked about consistency being uh, misinterpreted. So we've reframed that question as um, how ideal was the amount of quality time or effort spent on this, so say, let's say family in the last week. Um, so, so the idea was, uh, so the focus was not on consistency, but on how ideal something was. Um, and, and that then can match up with, um, according to the importance of that area of life for you, um, how ideal was, was your the quality time or effort spent on it. Um, we also did a number of other things, like um, got them to rate their consistency of action or how ideal the quality time or effort was straight after they'd rated the importance of each domain. So they didn't have to switch back and forth between um, between domains. So in, in the original version, they rate the importance first, then they rate the consistency or valued living. Um, but we got them to think about each domain, like um, both the importance and the, the value action, valued action at once um, in the new version. We gave lots of co concrete examples um, of value consistent actions, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, to deal with that issue of uh, how how you rate um, areas that aren't important, um, we we um, stopped asking for ratings of um, valued living for any life domains that were rated less than five for importance, because you know at the in, end of the day we were most interested in um, how much time or effort was being devoted to the areas that actually were important to each individual. Um, and then some of the terminology in the original version um, was often misinterpreted. So, for example, citizenship as a word was kind of interpreted as meaning, you know, whether or not you're a citizen of a particular country rather than your involvement in the community. So we renamed those domains that were commonly misinterpreted. So this is what um, the instructions look like. Um, so the, in the original questionnaire, is quite a long um instruction that's quite sort of abstract. So we just simplified it right down. We're going to ask you about different areas of your life. Let's get started with family. Um, and then a bit a more detailed option for people with milder communication difficulties. Um, and in the administration instructions, we also gave a lot of um, prompts for administrators to um, guide them about what sorts of communication support methods they might like to use if there were issues with comprehending the, the questions. Um, so this is um, uh, what the, the adapted version looks like. So, um, for example, in the family domain, 
this is this first bit is on one page. How important is family to you at the moment? It's a picture um, to support comprehension of that idea. And then um, uh, they have to circle on this scale, which includes visual aids um, about how important that is. Um, and then for the, the second question, which is about valued living, um, you know, in the last week, how much quality time or effort have you spent on family? Is it an ideal amount or not ideal? And you can see here we've added some um, concrete examples of what those actions might look like for somebody who did value family. So that might be showing affection to your family members, spending time with family, doing things to help family. Um, and the in the administration instructions, um, we also tell administrators that they can expand on those examples and make um, and include others that might they know are more relevant to that person as well. So to individualize um, those examples as much as possible. And so then you can see on this rating scale, they're rating how ideal um, their actions were um, according to how important that domain is. So yeah, I guess in contrast to the original version where there's um, just a list of, of life areas without much added explanation, um, it's quite a different look uh, for the, the um, new version. So this is the importance rating and then the consistency rating or ideal valued living um, rating. So um, after we'd done all those changes, we wanted to check, is this a valid measure? Um, and so uh, we, we uh, looked at both its test retest reliability um, and, uh, and its convergent and divergent validity. So how well it aligned with similar measures and didn't align with dissimilar measures. Um, and we did um, two studies, one with people with acquired brain injury and then another with neurotypical adults because we also wanted to see um, did these changes also help people who didn't have acquired brain injury um, uh, comprehend what the measure involved uh, better as well. So um, we, uh, for the test retest reliability, we got some interesting results. So we started off the acquired brain injury study before 2020, and then um, we analyzed the data um, uh, uh, at an interim analysis at the beginning of 2020. We found really good test retest reliability. And then um, later on, we kept collecting data during the pandemic and in our final analysis, it had dropped quite a bit. So I was a bit confused with that. And I thought, oh, I wonder about lockdowns impacting um, how well people could act on uh, doing things that were important to them. And so we divided the sample into people whose lockdown status had remained the same between the first time point and the second time point, and people whose lockdown status changed from the first to the second time point. And we found that um, those who whose status was the same, there was very good test retest reliability. Um, but when it changed, that was quite poor, which makes a lot of sense. So, you know, if for example, somebody was in lockdown and they weren't able to go out for coffee with their friend um, and social relationships were one of the things that was important to them, um, then, you know, that will affect how, how that their actions that are in line with their personal values. So, so that was an interesting and unexpected, like we didn't set out to find that, but um, uh, it was an interesting incidental finding. Um, we then, um, looked at uh, construct validity and found that the um, valid living questionnaire was correlated with similar measures um, in both cohorts. Um, and the divergent validity was um, good for the neurotypical cohort, um, but it was marginal in the acquired brain injury cohort. And um, that was probably in retrospect um, because you know we used a memory um, measure, memory um, complaints measure as the dissimilar measure. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of know that, you know, the presence of cognitive difficulties will impact valued living um, for some people. So uh, we chose that measure because it was um, a convenient sample where they had already had that measure. Um, but, yeah, in retrospect, probably wasn't the greatest choice for a divergent validity measure, especially in the ABI cohort. Um, so, yeah, overall, though, uh, the consistency scale, which is part two, where we measure valued action in each domain, 
In our version, the test retest reliability was quite a bit higher than the original valued living questionnaire. And so that, that original study, they had proposed that um, that their test retest reliability was low because people's um, actions vary a lot from week to week. And so the, their value consistency of actions will also vary. Um, but, you know, we, in finding that the test retest reliability was higher, for, especially when lockdowns status was the same, um, perhaps it might be that the adapted version was more reliable because also um, it reduced the likelihood of comprehension errors on, um, on item responses. So it's possible that value consistent actions actually aren't in fact as variable from week to week as originally thought. Um, so look, this speaks really to the importance of ensuring that questionnaires are valid and um, understood as intended, even for people without cognitive or communication difficulties. And so I'm quite glad that we also looked at neurotypical um, uh, participants because you know this really speaks to the importance of using measures um, well, the use of measures that are accessible and appropriate for people with cognitive and communication difficulties can actually benefit everybody. Yeah, so that's basically what I said there. So, um, and, you know, it's just a measure at the end of the day, but what we hope is that um, this measure can be a meaningful way of um, measuring valued living for clinicians and researchers um, to detect when um, valued living is an issue that might, um, in the, where they might need some support um, and to measure the outcomes of interventions as well. Um, and actually some health services have started using it to also guide goal setting as well to, so that in areas where um, perhaps valued living is low, um, you can set goals that will improve participation in those val valued activities. So, um, I'll now talk briefly about um, a related study that we did after that um, validation study, where we wanted to, um, we were also interested in seeing what, uh, how the values that were identified as important um, in our acquired brain injury sample compared to a, a neurotypical comparison group, and also how the value living questionnaire responses lined up with another measure of values. So, these were our aims. We wanted to identify and compare important personal values in adults with ABI and neurotypical comparison group and evaluate associations between value domains and mood and then assess alignments between two measures. So the, the comprehension support version that I've just been talking about of the value living questionnaire and then also the value card sort task. So this is um, uh, a, a activity that's often included in, um, in therapy that focuses on valued living, um, which is often uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, for example. Um, and so we developed this value card sort task for use in an um, in intervention that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, and we purposely um, designed these value cards to be as accessible as possible. So describing values in a sort of active dynamic way where the link to action could, could be um, generated fairly easily. Um, and as you can see, there's um, pictures on each uh, card as well to try and support understanding. Um, and what they need to do is uh, um, sort each value into one of three piles that you can see there, very important, important or not important to me. And then we get them to choose their top five most important values from the very important to me pile. Um, and the value cards form um, fall into these categories, the same as the, the value living questionnaire. So we had um, 43 participants with acquired brain injury um, and 50 neurotypical participants in this study. And um, they were pretty well matched in age. Um, there were slightly higher proportion of males in the ABI group. Um, and the, again, the majority of our participants were stroke survivors. So, um, what we did is we looked at the domains of the value living questionnaire that were rated highest in importance in both groups. And um, they were the same actually. So people who, with acquired brain injury and people who were neurotypical rated the same things as being important. So this was family, marriage and relationships, parenting and health and well-being. We also were interested to see what um, value card sort cards were selected as most important. 
And these were actually all from these same four domains. So that suggested a good alignment between um, the things that were being identified as important on, on each, each, each measure. So interestingly, the top five value cards most commonly selected by people with acquired brain injury, you can see here below, four of them, are again, about relationships with other people. So, um, uh, you know, and interestingly, the, the one uh, top five value card that was different to the neurotypical group was to be independent. Um, and for the neurotypical group, that was to help others. So that was an interesting difference. Um, but, you know, I just want to stop and reflect on the fact that, you know, the, the values, the areas of life that are most important to everyone are really around relationships with others is one of the things that is fun fundamentally human, I guess. And, you know, often in, in brain injury rehabilitation, we spend a lot of time working on um, activities of daily living and, and everyday function and um, relatively less time on um, relationships and communication with others um, and how to foster healthy relationships where people feel connected. And um, these results really speak to the importance of that for, for many people. So yeah, it was interesting that the questionnaire and the card sort measures gleaned these similar findings about you know, the importance of values about relationships with close others and also health and well-being really important to both groups. Um, uh, so the other thing that we found was that lower valued living in these key domains of family, work and community um, was associated with lower mood. So again, speaking to that important relationship between mood and doing what matters to you. Um, and so this really supports the idea that interventions that facilitate the development of new value consistent actions in these areas with family, with friends, with work, um, or, or um, so that includes volunteer work and study. Um, this is really warranted to optimize outcomes for um, people with acquired brain injury. So, so the final study I'm going to talk about is um, uh, our Valued Living After Neurological Trauma or Valiant trial. This is a group program um, that we developed to uh, address or improve valued living. Um, and it combines acceptance and commitment therapy, which is an evidence-based psychological therapy, and also cognitive rehabilitation for people with acquired brain injury. So this, um, the trial was conducted um, by Nick Sapanantham, who's a doctoral student um, who's just writing up his thesis. So a Valiant is, um, yeah, like I said, an eight-week group intervention for adult survivors of ABI. And um, it's for anyone who's experienced cognitive or emotional changes that have impacted their participation in valued activities. So what we really aim to do is um, facilitate psychological adjustment and well-being and increase valued living. And as I said, the, the thing that's unique about it is that it does combine cognitive rehabilitation and acceptance commitment therapy. The idea being that um, the, the people face both cognitive and emotional barriers to doing what matters to them. And that in this intervention, we hope to concurrently address both of those sets of barriers. So um, uh, in the eight weeks, we cover um, a range of different life domains. So bookended by a sort of introduction session about values and valued living and what that's all about. And then the final session to, to help maintain progress. Um, but in the middle, we've got um, that weeks two and three focus on health and well-being, um, and in particular on sleep and fatigue and exercise and diet. Then in week four and five, they're about um, having a purpose or purposeful activity. So there's um, a session on being productive in, in terms of work or study or community involvement. Um, and then uh, one on leisure and doing fun things, um, which is always a fun session. Um, and then in the sixth and seventh session, we uh, we look at um, connecting and communicating with others. Um, and in that um, seventh session, family members and friends are also invited to attend um, and they learn about some of the things that we've been um, discussing in the Valiant program. So there's a few core components to each session. We do um, set a fair bit of homework, which really is designed to um, be between session practice of the sorts of new ideas and strategies that um, we talk about in the sessions. 
Um, there's a big psychoeducation component so people understand and learn about these concepts and, and how they apply to them. Um, we, in each session, do values clarification activity, which is that card sort activity that you saw before. Um, and that helps people clarify what's important to them. And we do a different card sort activity for each life domain too. So, for example, with health, they then choose their, their top five um, uh, most important values in that domain. And then for each session, they choose one that they want to work on that week. So once they've chosen that value that they want to work on that week, they then um, we, help, we support them to generate goals or actions that um, are in line with that value. Um, we then uh, have a look at what cognitive and emotional barriers might get in the way of doing those things. And then they learn strategies to address those, those barriers. So um, we include both cognitive and communication strategies, so things like memory aids, planning and organisational strategies, and then communication strategies um, with a particular focus on sort of ways to advocate for their personal needs um, and, um, you know, so, so communicating about their strengths and, and what um, their support needs are. Um, and then uh, we uh, also learn a bunch of acceptance and commitment therapy strategies that include things like mindfulness and there's a passengers on the bus metaphor, which is I won't go into, but it's basically um, a way of sort of reframing your relationship with um, difficult thoughts um, that might get in the way of um, feeling, say, confident enough to engage in, in a new activity. And then um, we yeah set homework each week where they're, the main component of which is to do the things that they've set out on their way to valued living worksheet. So do their value consistent actions. So we um, have published a single case experimental evaluation of Valiant. Um, and we've also just, this is the randomized controlled trial protocol that just published. We're um, writing up the, the results of that um, RCT at the moment. And we also did a qualitative evaluation um, of the program as well. So I'm not gonna spend lots of time talking about that. I'll just briefly summarize to say that we found that Valiant was feasible and acceptable to participants with acquired brain injury, and that we found that it did. Um, sh there were some um, improvements in well-being and in anxiety and depression symptoms, valued living, and self-efficacy uh, for participants who who received the Valiant intervention. Um, and our qualitative findings were also really interesting and um, showed that um, those that um, People described uh, Valiant really facilitating um, identity reconstruction. So this idea of, you know, doing what matters to you, what's personally important to you, um, and that being a bit different to before, but but still, you know, important. And that that concept of of finding a new way to kind of do valued living um, was really helpful in adjusting to to life post brain injury. So that was really nice to see. So some final key messages. Um, I think you know uh, this body of work, and and I'm not the only one looking at this. Is um, really accumulating evidence in this area, showing that fostering valued living um, really optimizes outcomes for people with acquired brain injury, and in fact everyone. Um, and that you know measurement of valued living does need to be tailored to suit people with cognitive and communication difficulties, um, and you know that. The work that we did in in um, in the valued living questionnaire, I'm now trying to replicate in a bunch of other um, measures that we commonly use too. Even things like depression and anxiety measures, which are very widely used, um, not all of them are, are very accessible either. So, I'm um, doing some work to develop um, more accessible measures of other constructs too. Um, yeah, and the accessible measurement, accessible processes, and interventions that target um, things that are relevant to, to this cohort um, will improve clinical practice and research for everyone. Thank you so much for listening. And yes, we have time for questions. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. Um, and it was so nice to see um, something I'm particularly interested in, how we assess cognition in people with aphasia. And it's so nice to see you adapting some of these so that they are more accessible and it's something that needs to be done across the board because as I'm sure you're aware not only are 
we missing clinical information that people are being excluded from research studies as well. Because absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, um, couldn't um, agree more. Can I start off with a question? We've got a couple of questions coming in. Please do ask your questions in the Q&A box, but I'm going to start off um, with a question. So in your study three, did you have anyone with, I guess, what we call more severe language impairments? And if so, so in the Valiant trial you're talking about? Yeah, the yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we did have people with mild to moderate, but we did not have anyone that I would call um, have, as, or well, I'd say had severe aphasia. Um, and, you know, that was um, really because we, did, we, I guess we were testing out this intervention um, in a group format where we were trying to make it um, uh, suitable for, for people with cognitive impairment as well. And, um, you know, that I guess we knew that we wouldn't be able to to um, fit the, the the program as it was designed into like well, to make it suitable when there were participants with severe aphasia in the group. Um, but it's absolutely a direction that I really want to head in. Um, I'm quite keen to um, do a I, I think it would be a new version of of the intervention um, that was suitable for people with moderate to severe aphasia. Um, you know, we there was quite a lot packed into each session. I think we'd need to reduce that, um, but it's something that I'm really keen to to look at doing because, um, yeah, I think there's definitely good scope and reason to, for that work to happen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with some of the questions that are coming in. So we've um, Isaac Tam has asked, um, can a next of kin or guardian fill this out if the person is unable to complete this due to his aphasia or cognitive impairment? Yeah, so I assume that was in relation to the valued living questionnaire. So, yeah, I mean, um, we, in our, uh, both our cognitive interviewing study and then the adaptation study, we we just did the questionnaire with um, people with acquired brain injury and we didn't use it with their um, with close others. But I I, um, I think that, that would be um, certainly very appropriate. I mean, what you, you I guess you want to, with with that, you want to be sure that you are capturing um, the personal values of the person, um, and you know not the the close other. And and sometimes with this values work, uh, what I notice is in the intervention in particular, um, some people t tend to leap to values that they know are socially acceptable, and um, and they may need some encouragement to really kind of truly identify um, that something isn't important to them if they think that other people think it should be yeah. um so you know I guess that that's one I guess potential issue to look out for if you have a close other um helping somebody fill out a, a questionnaire about personal values and their importance is that you really want to be sure that they're um uh expressing you know the their genuine you know um personal values and you're tapping into that um and, and not the kind of social desirability response. Yeah, and I yeah. guess if you adapt it enough, there's no reason why you do have to have a significant other. Yes, that. yes. Great, thank you. So the next question, what was the self-efficacy measure that you used in the Valiant study? Yeah, so it was actually, um, an, uh, it was a, originally a traumatic brain injury self-efficacy scale, which we then adapted to be more broadly about brain injury. Um, and I quite like it. It's um, it's actually not as um, widely used or validated as um, as it could be. I think um, it's got a lot of potential. It's, it's, what I like about it is that it focuses on um, how uh, confident the person is to manage various aspects of life with a, a brain injury and um, the extent to which things like cognitive dysfunction or mood might get in the way of um that of that kind of sense of I can do this, I can manage. Um, so yeah, um, it's uh, uh, the reference is Huckins et al. If you want to look it up, um, yeah, and I'm also happy to share it uh, if you email me. Um, but yeah, I quite like it as a as a self efficacy measure. Thank you. Um, some more questions coming through. Uh, thank you so much. Were the participants with stroke or left hemisphere with aphasia, or were they mixed right and left? mixed right and left yeah and um so yeah I guess the the studies that I presented were all um a 
um, mixed ABI sample, except for the very first one where I was talking about the relationship between valued living and outcomes. So all of the other studies I've talked about today did have a mixed sample. So um, while stroke survivors were the um, uh, you know majority of the sample in for several of the studies, there also was quite a number of people with traumatic brain injury. So um, there was often a mix of people with more left hemisphere um, uh, kind of communication difficulties, and then some cognitive communication difficulties as well. So um, yeah, that both kind of right and left hem hemisphere presentations were certainly represented in the samples across all of those studies. Be interesting to see if there is a, a divide in how people respond depending on kind of the, the etiology. That they're absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I guess with uh, measuring valued living and sort of um, self-evaluating whether what you're doing is in line with your values, that there's a fair bit of kind of abstract reasoning that goes into that and and sort of insight and awareness and so people with those more right hemisphere cognitive communication difficulties um sometimes can um struggle with that um awareness of of yeah how how what they are doing lines up with their values um yeah. it is it's it's a complex um thing to try and estimate and judge yeah I love how it's overlapping so much with neuroscience as well, what we know about lesion location. Mm. Um, Jan Cameron is asking, how did you seek participants for your studies and what length of time from their ABI event? Yeah, um, so um, almost all my studies are with a, a kind of longer term sample. So with Valiant Trial, for example, um, the eligibility criterion was that they needed to be at least three months post-injury. Um, and that's often the case with the intervention trials that I do because um, when it's uh, learning kind of strategies to manage cognitive and psychological difficulties, I think it does help to have um, um, some settling of, of the initial acute issues um, so that uh, the ongoing kind of consequences of and what life might look like ongoingly post um uh, post brain injury is becomes a little bit clearer and then you can work with you know the the life post stroke post pain post brain injury um but you know the the there was no upper limit on how long after acquired brain injury um the our participants could be so we did certainly have some participants who were 15 20 years post brain injury and um really interestingly they often reported that they learned a bunch of new things and found that really useful so you know, I'm a strong believer that it's never too late and um, that we, you know, we should continue to offer supports for people um, as they live um, long lives with with potentially with um, acquired brain injury. So um, really encouraging to see, uh, you know, we're currently in the middle of our analyses looking at predictors of outcome um, with the Valiant trial and time post-injury is one of the predictors we're looking at. Haven't yet got those results. So waiting to to find out what we did find there. But it'll be really interesting because, yeah, I think it's, um, while there is that pattern of uh, valued living, you know, seeming to dip a little bit between one and three years post-injury, you know, where that might be a right time to really conduct those interventions and try and optimise valued living so we can bring that adjustment process earlier. Um, yeah, we, we still yet to kind of explore our data and find out whether or not we could do that. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got a lot of people interested in this in the audience here today. Um, another question, kind of, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but I guess more um, straight to the point. What are your reflect? This is from Ellen Bernstein Ellis. So, what are your reflections about having mixed etiologies in your belly and mm. um, therapy study, and were there benefits or drawbacks? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question, and one that I think about quite a lot because. Uh, a lot of my research is with mixed ABI sample, and one of the reasons for that. Well, there's a few reasons. A key one, though, is that our um, brain injury rehabilitation services are generally not diagnosis specific. So um, all of the ones that I'm aware of, I mean, you, you have obviously acute stroke services, for example, but when you get into particularly community rehabilitation, um, it's it's much more likely that, that the service or the clinician or the private practice or whatever it is, is going to be working with people with mixed etiologies. And so um, I'm very keen on doing research that um, is easily implementable into clinical practice. And so the, the leap from um, 
from a group that has a mixed etiology to practicing delivering a group in practice with a mixed etiology is um, a closer leap, then um, it's it's less likely you're going to get a um, be able to recruit enough people for for a group um, that is a single etiology, and and that's the other reason that I often do that is you just open up your recruitment and can particularly for group interventions you need a certain minimum number for each group so um so yeah really the benefits I think are a multiple in that yeah it's easily at, um uh, implementable and, and more of that's clinical practice but also you know people with um different forms of acquired brain injury share so many different of the of the same issues and um, sometimes it, it can help to hear that um, from, from other people with a kind of different set of issues to know that you're not just not alone within your little diagnostic circle, but also just more widely with it, people with living with conditions that affect the brain face very similar issues. So um, that sharing amongst people, humans um, is, is helpful. Um, I think there are there can be drawbacks though. So um, in our Valiant trial, we uh, also included people with um, relapsing, remitting, multiple sclerosis, and they um, were a, a little bit different in nature, I suppose, to uh, somebody with an acquired brain injury where there's a single event and then there's a kind of a recovery process. Um, and you know, um, on occasion, I think if the per person with multiple sclerosis was the only one in the group who had MS. Sometimes they commented it might have been nice to have at least one other person with that diagnosis in the group. So um, because there are some slightly different issues, um, particularly with that that cohort. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it wasn't certainly not insurmountable. Um, and yeah, I think that the the shared issues were more prominent than the dif the differences. Brilliant. Okay, just one more question coming from John Pierce, um, and then I'll uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, and you you can't see this one, sorry, but interesting that helping others was a common value. Are there any studies on targeting altruism as a goal in intervention? And yeah, not, that's a that's a really good question. I I am not sure. I haven't looked recently about studies targeting altruism, but what I will say is that I feel that um, I'm quite interested to see um, how the group um, outcomes might change in a different context where people are not participating for research purposes. And also I had students co-facilitating the groups too. So the, the, the participants often commented that they really liked, you know, being part of this because, you know, the, the research findings will help others and um, and also they were helping kind of train the students too. Um, the students are often really grateful and, and overted that. And so um, I feel like, you know, some of the benefits of participating in Valiant were the fact that they, they had values around helping others and they were able to do that through, through participating because it was adding to our research knowledge and, um, and also helping train students. So um, those kind of uh, they were forms of valued living, I suppose. So I think, um, you know, targeting that, that and, and I think you see this with people who um, contribute as lived experience experts to research as well. Um, and, you know, and, and just generally people who participate in research, there, there is an altruistic component to that, um, that, you know, means that that is a valuable experience for them. It means that the, their experience of something that's, you know, negative has negative impacts can be used for somebody else's good um and you know i think that that's a really powerful thing of of um aspect of doing research that um i think probably has been understudied and sh could be um better um expounded and, and researched so yeah um i think there's lots of scope there brilliant well thank you very much that was incredible talk and uh, very uplifting in many ways i think um, so I'm just going to introduce our next speaker for the CRA seminar, and that's going to be Dr. Jacinda Secon, who's going to be presenting on enabling speech pathologists to feel confident and competent in counselling for support. I didn't get that. Sorry, Siri's trying to chime in. Oh, She's <laughs> got something to say about that. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, I'll say that again. So enabling speech pathologists to feel confident and competent in counselling for supporting psychological well-being 
in people affected by post-stroke aphasia. So this seminar, seminar will take place on Wednesday, the 27th of September. Do follow us on Twitter and via our community of practice for details of how to register for the seminar. Thank you for attending and thank you very much again, Dana, for your wonderful talk. Thanks so much for having me.